In 2018, the Supreme Court overturned a law that banned sports betting in most places in America, a decision that has led to our lives today, which is waking up and being absolutely waterboarded by sports gambling advertising. America's number one sports book. FanDuel. FanDuel Casino. FanDuel. Free chicken dinners with FanDuel Casino. By gambling at BetMGM Sportsbook. BetMGM. BetMGM. What do you want from your sportsbook? Please help me. Helmet catch. Stop guessing the helmet catch. Is it the Caesar Sportsbook app with Caesar's rewards where the more you play, the more stuff you earn, and they have fast payouts because Caesar is the man? Yes! My God, they even got the Tennessee Kardashians. Sports betting has become increasingly normalized in America over the last six years, but critics wonder if beneath the legal gambling industry's rise looms a public health crisis of unknown proportions. Portions. So is regulated gambling a healthy future for sports entertainment? Or have we opened a Pandora sports book, putting millions of people at risk of addiction? Let's fucking find out. Today, online sports betting is legal in 29 states and the freely associated island nation of Washington, D.C., with more states on the way. And with how quickly sports betting has become ubiquitous in American culture, it's easy to forget that gambling can actually kind of be bad for you. We've now been able to show over the last 25, 30 years that when people who gamble, the same parts of the brain are being activated as if I were taking alcohol, tobacco, cocaine, or cannabis. Dr. Tim Fong is the co-director of the UCLA Gambling Studies Program and a clinical professor of psychiatry. It impacts sleep, it impacts mood, it impacts finances, it impacts relationships. And when you have a product that's being given out and regulated by the government, it's got to be regulated and it's got to be understood. In 2013, the American Psychological Association officially classified gambling as an addiction. Meanwhile, since its 2018 legalization, sports betting has generated a gangbusters amount of economic activity in the U.S. $220 billion in bets were placed in just the first five years it was legal. There are now over 16 million average monthly users of the most popular sports betting apps. And next year, online sports betting revenue is expected to approach $12 billion. But to understand this growth trajectory, we got to talk about something called Daily Fantasy Sports. Daily Fantasy is an online version of Fantasy Sports, and according to my wife, a terrible reason to have my phone out during our kids' baptism. Fantasy is when you pick a bunch of real players, assemble a fake team out of them, and keep track of their stats. But around 2010, a new turbocharged version of Fantasy came onto the scene, where you could set new lineups as often as every day, play in apps on your phone, and crucially, put money down on the results. So you had two competitors that really arose uh, to the top of the market here, DraftKings and FanDuel. Kenneth Vogel is a New York Times investigative reporter who was part of a team that wrote a series of major stories about the betting industry's rise in America. And they made a business out of fantasy sports and allowed players uh, to wager, not wager, but put money on the performance of their teams. They would push back against the use of the term wager there. Even though gambling on sports was still broadly illegal, Congress had previously determined that fantasy sports were actually a game of skill, not luck, meaning that putting money on the results wasn't gambling. Which reminds me a lot of an argument my high school friend Chaz used to make about the pullout method. The gray area in which these fantasy companies operated was pretty controversial. Even at the time, a lot of state attorney generals and even some sportsbook CEOs publicly said that they considered daily fantasy to be gambling. But the industry saw it differently. So you don't view what you do here at uh, FanDuel is gambling. No. That's a word that isn't used very much around here, I take nope. it. Still, FanDuel and DraftKings clearly understood that they were operating in murky waters and made a huge lobbying push to defend themselves. And they were pretty successful. By 2017, 19 states had passed laws explicitly legalizing daily fantasy sports. But this effort wasn't just about creating a legal framework for daily fantasy. The industry's big kahuna was still out there, swimming around in the deep blue sea, just waiting to be caught. I'm talking about full-on sports Betting. Breaking news to Supreme Court this morning, striking down the federal ban on sports betting. Now it leaves it up to the states. When that happened, the industry was ready to get lobbying, thanks to their powerful network of relationships in state capitals that they built during their daily fantasy push. There was a lot of like whining and dining. That was, that was my colleague, Eric Lipton, and a photographer who went out to um, uh, Kansas. This is a party that uh, was sponsored by the industry, or by lobbyists who were representing the industry. The lawmakers were smoking cigars and drinking expensive scotch that was provided by the lobbyists and sort of schmoozing 
with them as the debate was unfolding a few blocks away in the Capitol. The industry's main arguments for legal sports betting both then and now are to fight black market gambling and generate tax revenue. There's this big illegal market and there's no consumer protections, no tax revenue being generated. Why don't we just bring that in-house? A lot of states are understanding that it's really just common sense legislation to allow mobile sports betting. Uh, it raises tax revenues and it puts an illegal market out of business. And look, I know it's easy to go around bashing these corporate CEOs, especially when they got this mid as hell Zoom background. What is this, a map of the lands you plan to conquer? Why, why do you have a bla black and white photo of the Industrial Revolution behind you? Come on, Matt. It could be worse. You've got some work to do, buddy. But my point, which I'm making very clearly and without getting sidetracked, my point is that the gambling black market is a problem and regulating it would generate tax revenue. One of our biggest concerns, we have so much of the unregulated sports betting market, right? So these are the websites uh, that are based in who knows where. They take all electronic you know, financing, so they're, they're not unsubjected to the uh, regulations of the state. But trying to shut them down is impossible because you don't even know where they exist. Now, it's impossible to know the exact size of the black market at this time, but some estimates had Americans illegally betting as much as $150 billion per year. But the industry's second point was that if states did vote to legalize, it would instantly create tax revenue. One of the things that the industry, sports betting industry, had going for it, you know, after 2018 was, uh, it, you know, uh, it's um, sort of a perverse way to think about it, but it was the pandemic. I mean, the pandemic put a real dent in state budgets. So the black market, the promise of tax revenue, state budgets absolutely decimated by the pandemic. It was the perfect storm for sports betting companies to capitalize on and capitalize they have. There's a huge investor appetite around it. The companies are turning over massive amounts of money. Everyone's very excited. Oliver Barnes is a reporter for the Financial Times who's been covering the gambling industry both in the US and the UK. Lawmakers are also quite excited, right? Because you're sitting in a state that's yet to um, legalize sports betting. You have a whole load of tax revenues you can just switch on there overnight. But in reality, many states who have voted to legalize have seen less tax revenue than expected. The, the industry, the sports betting companies and the gambling trade groups push for lower tax rates. While lobbying for legalization in states like Kansas, the industry argued that the best way for states to maximize their tax revenue would actually be to tax betting companies less because it would create an easier market for the companies to operate it. <laughs> okay, whatever you say, Mr. Businessman. <laughs> All right. But in 14 jurisdictions that legalized and followed the industry's tax advice, revenues in 2022 were nearly $150 million less than predicted. And in addition to negotiating lower tax rates, the industry also convinced many states to classify huge chunks of their advertising spend as tax write-offs. When we talk about deductions for advertising and marketing, what we're really talking about is the promotional bets. And so what that is, is you see an ad and it says, get your first $100 of like free bets or like we'll match your first $100 or what have you. And this is like an incentive that the gambling companies are using to bring in new customers. And what they did was they convinced lawmakers in most states to allow them to deduct the cost of these promotional bets. In 2022 alone, the industry gave out almost $1 billion in these promo bets, costing states more than $120 million in potential taxes. States are losing money on promotional bets. I'm losing money on promotional bets. You and I aren't so different after all, Kansas. Maybe this could work out between us. And though tax revenue generated by the industry post-legalization has been underwhelming, you might say the opposite about its approach to marketing. Spreads to cover, overs to hit, and chances to live bet from the first sound to the final whistle. Download BetMGM. You know what to do. The industry spent about $300 million on TV ads in 2023 and an estimated $1.8 billion in local markets. This marketing push even made it to college campuses. One deal between Michigan State and Caesars Sportsbook let Caesars Caesarize part of its campus. Another between Colorado Boulder and PointsBet gave the school $30 every time one of their students signed up for the app and placed a bet. Granted, there was a lot of backlash to these deals. The lead gambling industry trade group now prohibits marketing on college campuses. And since then, Michigan State, Colorado, and other schools have canceled their partnerships. But what's so bad about these ads anyway? Getting Caesar eyes sounds fun. The public health issue is that this is an addictive product. Oh, I get it. 
too fun. Richard Daynard is the lawyer who designed the litigation strategy against the tobacco industry, resulting in Big Tobacco coughing up over $200 billion and changing the way they market cigarettes. We lied and told him we were 60 minutes and he agreed to tell us about his next target, the sports betting industry. There's the denial of, you know, of dangers, presenting this thing as simply a harmless way to have fun. March 10th of last year, of 2023, that was the day that uh, sports betting was unleashed in Massachusetts. There was just massive marketing. You know, there'd be trash containers, it'd be on the side of uh, buses, uh, as well as on, uh, you know, television, just about anything you turned on would have an ad for, you know, one of the companies. Unfortunately, it's been a while since I've turned anything on, Professor. <laughs> Dainard's Public Health Advocacy Institute recently backed a lawsuit in Massachusetts against DraftKings, and its focus is on one of those fun tax write-off promotional ads. According to the lawsuit, DraftKings knowingly and unfairly designed a $1,000 sign-up bonus. The $1,000 comes in the form of additional bets, which customers could only get if they first deposited $5,000, risk $25,000 within 90 days, and bet on events with worse odds than three to one, which doesn't sound like I'm gonna get $1,000. The idea is for you to continue to bet, which is the way you develop and heighten an addiction, which is you keep at it, you keep doing it. We hope to you know, encourage you know, other litigation. This is hardly the only deceptive ad running in the United States. And there is some backlash building. We don't see cannabis ads on TV, do we? We don't see a lot of tobacco ads on TV anymore. And all that has an impact on what people think and feel about that product, right? When you look at the gambling ads right now, they're all 120% positive. Regulators in Ohio doled out almost a million dollars in fines last year to betting companies for advertising that customers could make free bets. Massachusetts and other states have moved to legally ban advertising on college campuses. And all the way up there in Maine, lawmakers propose banning cartoon characters, celebrities, athletes, and entertainers from being able to appear in ads. Which might sound extreme to us here in America, but is actually very similar to the way that lots of other countries regulate gambling advertising. In the UK, there's like a whistle to whistle ban on football matches you can't advertise like during a football match you know, in terms of like tv commercials because of the advertising environment where you're bombarded with ads it's very difficult to kind of escape that habit of like recurrently gambling the uk has also banned gambling logos on the front of premier league jerseys and other regulators want to move even further in australia gambling ads are banned during games between 5 a.m and 8 30 p.m in belgium and the netherlands have fully banned gambling advertising on tv radio newspapers and in public spaces Spaces. And these regulations are all reaction to the way that gambling has proliferated in these countries post-legalization. The UK Gambling Commission earlier this year said that as many as 2.5% of their adult population could be problem gambling. Meanwhile, in Australia, citizens lose more gambling per capita than in any other country. And some worry that if the US isn't careful, we might not learn from these more mature markets. The real issue is are we are escalating up to a tipping point where we could develop a gambling crisis like a gambling epidemic like we had with opioids. I don't think we're there yet, and I think having these conversations now should, I think, prevent and mitigate a lot of those things like that. Well, it's all in a day's work, Dr. Fong. Happy to solve a public health crisis whenever, sir. So outside of ad regulations, what are some options that we have to create a safer, legalized sports betting market? One obvious tool is self-exclusion, which just means giving people the option to tell these sports betting companies, hey, don't let me use these apps ever again. But US self-exclusion technology lags behind the UK's. So I go to FanDuel and I say, I wanna stop gambling, self-exclude me from FanDuel, which you can do in the US. But you then also have to go and self-exclude yourself from all the other apps. In some states, you can go to the state regulator and say, please self-exclude me from all of them. But in some states, that's an online process where you fill in a form. In some states, you literally have to write them a letter. And you compare that to the UK, where I go and ban myself from one betting app they'll ban me from all of them. When you look at the, the US, the, the actual safety mechanisms in place, there's just considerably less of them. Other areas where the US can make improvements include eliminating betting with credit cards, which 20 states allow, taking a closer look at live betting during games, where bettors can wager on things like how fast the next pitch will be, bets where the odds are more advantageous for the sports books than normal, and increasing the amount of public funding towards problem gambling resources. In fact, nine states provided zero 
funding for problem gambling services in 2023. And according to Dr. Fong, problem gambling receives just a fraction of the resources versus comparable programs for drugs and alcohol. Because the funding that's available for gambling research and treatment compared to alcohol, tobacco, and substances is, is infinitesimal. It's tiny, barely registers. Bars. So we need to better understand how do we keep people in that lane of social recreational gambling without harm. But looking at all of these legal problems, lawsuits, and Kevin Hart telling me to download an app he probably doesn't use, it just makes me wonder if this has all been worth it. Is the industry right when they argue that the legalized system we're creating is better than just the good old black market? I don't know. What does someone with a smarter voice think? There's some truth in it, right? Which is, Yes, they shifted a large number of consumers from the black market where there are no protections at all into a regulated market where there are some protections. But for me, I think the main thing that's under um, understated in all of that is just the denominator. But if you just have more people exposed to gambling products, you're likely to get a large number of people who face the negative side effects of gambling, which is a small proportion. But if you have hundreds of millions of people using the product, it's large, right? I think it's disingenuous to say that you know, this is a safer environment for all these people because a lot of those people would, would not have been gambling, I imagine, on sports unless it was just shown to them all over and all these ads and everything. Saul Malik is a former gambling addict who now travels the country speaking about the risks of sports betting. I do think that the technology, of course, will accelerate it and also turn people who say they're sports bettors into casino players very quickly because the need for action speeds up as it progresses as an addiction. Well, the good news is now with all this growth, the sports betting industry is gonna is gonna take a beat and clear their heads and, and really take some time to get this thing right before we escalate any further. There's actually even a further holy grail that they're still fighting for and that they, even at that early juncture back in the 2010s, it, were looking at as something that they that was the ultimate um, the ultimate goal. Oh no, what's that, Ken? And that is iGaming. It's essentially like full casino gambling on your phone, turn every phone into like, you know, a, a blackjack table or a slot machine or whatever that could operate 24 seven. Right now, iGaming is only legal in six states. And I'm sure for many of you, combining doom scrolling with doom slotting seems crazy. But also at one point, so was taking this sucker out, dialing up a heater of a parlay and throwing that shit on your Amex legally. But think of how far we've come with sports betting. I mean, look at the NFL. In 2003, the NFL wanted to distance themselves from the industry so much they rejected a proposal for Las Vegas to air a tourism ad during the Super Bowl. And now, the Eagles are doing paid partnership posts with DraftKings. In two days, the Super Bowl is going to be in Las Vegas. If all of this could happen in six years, who's to say what could happen in six more? 12, 18, 24, 30, 36. 42, 48, 54, 60, 60. I mean, it's hard to imagine, really. But if anything, it's important to recognize that we. America's number one sports book. FanDuel Casino. FanDuel. Wait, 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 no. I'm sorry. I'm DraftKings. 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 Playoffs, baby. The crown is yours. I'm trying to finish the. Oh, snap. DraftKings' new sports book app. For good work, I'm. There's no better feeling than a win, except the BetMGM win. For good work, I'm Dave I think for anyone in the audience that's just curious about their own relationship with money or with gambling or worried about someone else's, the best thing is to just get informed. You know, there are a lot of websites now, like the National Council on Problem Gambling, or they can look at our website, uclagamblingprogram.org. Almost every state in America has gambling help, like 1-800-GAMBLER is an easy first stop to get professional uh, support.